Why is your organization pursuing a net zero goal? What are the benefits and why is this important to Unilever? So, uh, good morning. Unilever already actually had science-based targets to eliminate GHGs, greenhouse mm -hmm. gases, uh, from our own operations and half GHG emissions of our products by 2030. But with almost half of our GHG emissions coming from our raw materials, we knew when we realized that we had to do a lot more if we really wanted to be able to lower our environmental impact overall. So really thinking about upstream. So last year, we launched what we call our Unilever Compass, so an integrated business and sustainability plan. And we took the extra step of setting an ambitious target to reach net zero across the value chain by 2039. Um, Evidently, it's really important that we take that step and we look in a much more broad way across our entire ecosystem. We all know that this decade is, is, is make or break now. We've really got to make sure that the private sector is on track to reach net zero by mid-century. And of course, from a commercial perspective as well, it's really, really important for our business. We need to use the reach and the breadth and the depth and stretch of our brands to talk about what we're doing in a consumer facing way. We know that consumers now are much more aware around carbon issues. And it's really, really important that business takes a very proactive step. Absolutely. And so you've given some great examples already, but I don't know if you'd like to highlight a couple of positive actions that your company is taking already that is driving the change needed to make net zero a reality. So Unilever, when we approach these big complex global issues, we tend mm. to do it in, in four ways. So thinking about our own operations, thinking across our supply chain, thinking about our brands and then our role in wider society. So in our own operations, we've switched already to 100% renewable grid electricity globally. We've reduced CO2 emissions from energy from our factories by 75% against where we started. In 2008, we've got zero waste to landfill um, across all of our factories. Mm -hmm. And then when you think about our value chain, we've reduced emissions in the sourcing of raw materials and packaging, manufacturing, transport. When you think about the brands, we've really put a sustainability lens across the innovation process. So for example, we've done things like concentrated liquid laundry detergents. So they're fitting now into much smaller bottles. We're eliminating all fossil fuel based carbon out of the home care portfolio. And we launched earlier this year what we're calling our climate and nature fund. So it's a billion euros that we're going to spend by 2030 that will enable the brands to invest in projects that are protecting nature and really helping us towards the, the climate and nature targets that we've set out. What do you see as the most significant hurdle when it comes to companies achieving net zero? How have you been able to overcome this? So I think there's a lot that business can do and we need to do mm -hmm. to transform our own operations and, and our value chains. So I think a lot of that is around companies working together pre-competitively uh, and sending important demand signals to the market. So for example, a lot of the work that we've done uh, on things like setting up sustainable sourcing of, of, of raw materials, so crops and commodities that are essential to our business, making sure that we do that in partnership with others. But of course, there is only so far that, that we can go on our own. Not everything is within our control. So to reach mm -hmm. net zero, it's really, really important that governments play their parts as well. So if I think, for example, about some of the work that we've tried to do over the past 10 years to encourage consumers to live their lives in a more environmentally friendly way, if the energy that they're using to run, for example, a shorter machine wash on, on, on their washing machines or taking a shorter shower, if that isn't coming from renewable energy sources, it's going to be much harder for us to see the changes that we all need to see. So if you think about that from a government perspective, really a big ask to accelerate the rollout of renewable energy so that consumers can get clean electricity off the grid wherever they are in the world. Uh, 
Um, so Unilever has a long experience of working on these issues, but what would you say would be two or three top key learnings uh, for companies who are just starting on their journey? From my perspective, I think Unilever has been on a long journey uh, over the past 10 years trying to, to really change the way that we're orienting the business. And I think the first key learning is you cannot separate business performance and sustainability and view them as binary choices. And if they're not mutually exclusive, one drives the other. So I think that's really important. You need to embed your net zero, your climate targets, your sustainability work at the absolute core of your business strategy. And that's what we've tried to do at Unilever with the Unilever Compass. And I think the second thing is really thinking about who are the other stakeholders up and down your value chain that you need to connect with if you really want to be able to bring about the changes that, that you've set yourself. So, for example, we're working with suppliers uh, on reducing emissions upstream, but we're also working with, with the supermarkets, with the retailers uh, on talking to consumers about the kind of changes that they can make through different buying choices to, 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 to live a greener lifestyle. Um, we've talked a little bit as well around governments, but I think also for us, a crucially important audience is, is, is investors. And investors really want to see roadmaps and goals and targets in the short and the medium and the long term. So we launched at Unilever a climate transition action plan um, that sets out how we're going to get to the targets that we're talking about in 2030 and 2039. And I think having those interim targets in place and actually showing the tangible actions you're going to take are really, really important. On COP26, what are the most important outcomes that you're really looking for? So COP26, I think, will be a success when the world goes from this agreement in principle uh, to actually having an action plan in practice. So there's been lots of talk about this being the, the last best chance to get onto a one and a half degree trajectory and really restore the natural world. So we need to take action now. So. I would like to see stretching climate goals from all of the countries that, that are turning up, that are aligned with that one and a half degree trajectory. And then we want to see the programs in place to be able to deliver on that. So on a practical level, I think that means things like ending subsidies for, for fossil fuels. So think about coal, um, carbon price, really scaling up renewable energy uh, and electric vehicles so that it's much easier for everybody to be able to make more sustainable choices. And then thinking about how are you going to and then implementing nature based solutions because climate change and, and, and biodiversity obviously are, are inextricably linked. So you've got to actually address all of them together. And I think to do all of that, there's got to be sufficient public finance in place to help all countries, in, including in developing and emerging markets, to be able to take action and to implement those programmes. Just uh, when we come to European policy on climate, what are your key priorities for the Fit for 55 package? What are, you, what are your views on it at the moment? So we all know that for successful businesses to, to thrive, you've got to have stable climate. Um, you've got to have regenerative practices in place. So we need to take decisive global action on both. So you need to integrate climate work, land use work and biodiversity goals. And I think what Fit for 55 package is doing is bringing all of that together. So you've got businesses and policymakers working in partnership on how we're going to end or reverse nature loss and, and half emissions by, by 2030. 